Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States. Episode 3.42, Season in Review, Part 1. Before we jump into our review, I want to remind you all that this is your very last chance to get me any questions that you may have for our upcoming question and answer episode. This is the final reminder that you are going to get on the show itself. The cutoff for getting me questions is when the next episode posts, so you basically have got two more weeks. On Sunday, November 27th, I'm going to stop taking questions. I plan on answering as many questions as I can, so yeah, please get those my way. Today, we are going to be taking a quick tour back through the events of this season. Our review is going to be like what we did at the end of Season 2. Today, we are going to be doing a quick recap, and then next week we will spend our time trying to figure out what it all means. I'm going to give my standard disclaimer that this episode is going to be recapping the last 41 episodes in just 30 minutes. So if this is where you are jumping on board with the podcast, be aware that you are really just getting the Cliff Notes version of things. During my time covering the colonial period, I broke it down into three distinct phases. The first season of this podcast was focused virtually entirely on the founding of the colonies. There have been, of course, some stragglers. I'm looking at you, Georgia. But really, the story of our first season was the story of the founding of the North American British colonies. The second season took that story beyond the founding and examined the turbulent growing pains of the young colonies moving through the fall of James II during the Glorious Revolution. The colonies during this era were very much learning the limits of what they could do, as well as often chafing under English policy. What emerges is a period of near-constant upheaval from 1675 through 1692. This season, we picked up the story on the other side of the Glorious Revolution. We spent our time looking at how the colonies would grow and mature, Over the course of this past season, we have seen massive growth, both in terms of the population and with the economy. The North American colonies begin developing their own culture and customs that are often distinct from those back in Britain. At the end of this season, we find ourselves considering a colonial system that differs vastly from what we had started the season with. At the start of the season, the colonies were really just trying to figure out and understand where they stood in the wake of the Glorious Revolution. They knew the game had changed and were trying to find out by just how much. At the end of this season, we see a much larger set of colonies celebrating their role in a victory over the French in the French and Indian War. As we began this season, we were looking at the state of the colonies in the immediate aftermath of the Glorious Revolution. The stresses of a decade and a half of strife had left the colonies searching for what comes next. This would be felt differently depending on the colony. However, universally, the 1690s would prove to be a time of coming to grips with the events of the prior decade. In New England, this question literally meant a period of years where the colonists had to live in limbo, wondering what was coming. Following the collapse of the Dominion of New England, The immediate effect was an attempt by the old Puritan faction to return the world to how it had been in those days before the dissolution of the Massachusetts Bay Charter. Yet everybody realized that. Try as they might, those days were behind them. The effort to overthrow Edmund Andros had been something conducted by the entire colony. Both Puritans and moderates alike had played their role in bringing down the much-hated Dominion governor. Now, however, Once it was done, the question shifted to, what do we do next? This question was something that plays out not just in New England, but throughout the colonies. During 1689, we saw rebellions break out throughout the colonies. Besides the overthrow of Andros, we see Leisler's rebellion in New York and the overthrow of Lord Baltimore as the Lord Proprietor of Maryland. The colonists, having openly rebelled against the English overlords, were forced into a position of having to defend their actions. The opportunistic colonists would defend their actions by linking what they had done to the greater glorious revolution in England. In New England, Andrews had been an agent of the ousted King James II. With James II having to skip across the channel for the safety of his French exile, 
the colonists in Boston could defend their actions by removing his agent. In Maryland, the colonists used the same logic, stating that they had removed the Catholic Lord Baltimore, much as how William III had removed the Catholic James II. By creating analogous situations, the colonists could tie their behavior to the actions of their new monarch. How could William and Mary punish the colonies when the new royal family had literally done just the exact same thing? Now, to be sure, William III recognized that the colonists had a point, and being the new guy at the company, he had little interest in upsetting his new subjects. However, despite this, it is critical to understand that in reality, William III's colonial policy was not a significant deviation from that of James II. William III's colonial policy was one of centralization. In Massachusetts, this meant that while there would be an assembly, there would also be a royal governor to keep things in check. Anglicanism would be formally recognized in the colony, and the Puritan church would no longer serve as the gatekeeper to colonial politics. This would mark the end of the Puritan stranglehold over politics in Massachusetts. To the South in Maryland, William III had little hesitation in giving into colonial demands and kicking Baltimore to the curb. This isn't because of any deep passion for the rights of the Maryland colonists, but because it gave William III the opportunity to end the proprietary government in the colony and create a royal colony, something that he was more than happy to do. The new charters, especially in New England, illustrated another critical point, however. Despite the best arguments of the colonists in North America that they held the same rights as their brethren back in England proper, it became abundantly clear that this was not the prevailing view back in London. The colonies were not the same as Englishmen in England. In the name of efficient colonial administration, their rights were less than those living back on the home island. This is going to create a tension that would remain simmering just under the surface for years and indeed decades to come. The biggest story that we have discussed this season, except for the French and Indian War, was the growth of the colonies. Following Queen Anne's War, the colonies moved into a period of relative peace and stability that came to help define the first half of the 18th century for them. As the 17th century gave way to the 18th century, we saw several trends emerge that would help map out the coming decades of American history. The colonies were seeing an increasing amount of immigration, and critically, these new colonists were coming from different groups than we had seen before. Before 1680, the North American colonies, with the exception of New York, had been almost universally made up of English colonists. However, as we move into the 18th century, there was a noticeable increase in the immigration with groups of Huguenots, Scots, Jews, and Germans coming into the colonies. Now, to be sure, the colonies were still mostly made up of a majority of English colonists. However, it was no longer quite as one-sided as it had been just a short time before. Critically, and especially regarding those French Huguenots fleeing France in the aftermath of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, those coming into the North American colonies tended to be skilled laborers. This is going to help revolutionize the colonial economy, especially in the years after Queen Anne's War. These groups coming into America also were different from what we had seen before because unlike earlier, there is not going to develop a Huguenot colony. There would not be a Jewish nor a German colony. Instead, these groups are integrating into the existing colonies. This leads to a widespread infusion of much-needed skilled labor throughout the colonies. From the end of the 1680s until the eve of the American Revolution, there would be a dramatic rise in the colonial population, something that was important in helping make the eventual revolution even possible. Beyond a mere numbers game, the colonial economy was changing as well. Nothing would come more to define this period of the colonial economy like the concept of salutary neglect. The idea of salutary neglect was put forth by British Prime Minister Robert Walpole. The idea behind the program is that rather than ruling with a heavy hand, a light touch made more sense when it came to dealing with the colonies. This is very much the complete opposite approach from what we had seen under James II and then into the reign of William and Mary. Whereas they sought consolidation from tighter controls over the empire, such as we saw with the Dominion of New England, 
Walpole saw that as being a detriment to British interests. What Walpole concluded is that the British could dramatically cut down costs by paring down colonial administration and allowing the colonists to handle that part by themselves. Of course, there was no illusion that the colonies would not cut corners in order to line their own pockets. However, the equation suggested that the economic growth from having fewer regulations, combined with not paying for inexpensive administration, would prove to give more economic benefits, even with the Americans pilfering some off the top. This plan by the British worked, and indeed it worked well. Lasting basically until the French and Indian War, salutary neglect would see the colonial economies expand at a rapid pace. As colonists gained wealth, their demand for luxury items increased, driving further economic gains for the British. It is impossible, though, to look at the dramatic growth both in terms of the population and the economy of the colonies without also addressing the institution of slavery. Slavery grew massively in the years following Bacon's Rebellion, and quickly the labor extracted from slaves became a critical component of the economy. It was likewise during the first four decades of the 18th century that the institution of slavery would become the familiar system that we recognize today. The first slaves brought over in 1619, and in the following decades, were more akin to indentured servants. Certainly, those being brought over had no say in the matter, and were being brought against their will. However, early on at least, their bondage was limited much in the same way that you would see with an indentured servant. This would change about halfway through the 17th century, and by the time we reach the beginning of the 18th century, bondage was not only a lifetime hold, but the children born to slaves inherited their parents' servitude. It is important to realize that slavery was not merely something that existed in the South at this point either. Slavery was spread throughout the colonies. In fact, one of the worst mass hysterias in American history would strike New York in 1741. It was there that fear over a mass slave conspiracy arose that saw 17 hang and another 13 burned at the stake. In the New England colonies like Massachusetts, where slavery existed, though in limited numbers, we find that their economy still depended on the practice. New England ships used a huge amount of their total carrying capacity, hauling human cargo to be sold at auction. However, well, slavery was not just limited to the South, there is no denying that the South was the region holding the largest numbers of slaves. Largely, this developed out of pragmatic reasons more than anything else. Sure, there were slaves in New York, but generally fewer were enslaved in these areas when the main job was keeping the house rather than something more labor-intensive. Contrast this with the South, where large plantations required dozens, if not hundreds, of slaves to maintain. In South Carolina, for instance, it was lost on nobody that slaves outnumbered the rest of the population by a margin of two to one. This created a situation that was, generally, more acutely felt in the southern plantation-based colonies. Specifically, it created a tremendous amount of fear that the slaves were going to rise up and murder the slave owner and their families. This fear of having large slave populations would lead to increasingly repressive and often brutal slave codes, with the hope that they would help lessen those risks. Instead of making everybody safer, however, these harsh codes would end up having the opposite effect. The harsher treatment would give slaves much less to live for, which, in turn, increased their willingness to consider drastic measures against the owners, who would then respond with even more draconian measures. In fact, following the Stono Rebellion, we see that South Carolina actually backed off some of their harshest slave codes to, hopefully, prevent future rebellions. Before moving on, I want to state again that while this is something that is felt more acutely in the South, let's not forget the events that I mentioned just a moment ago that had occurred in New York during 1741. Throughout all the colonies, there remained the persistent fear of slave rebellions. Slavery also would help define the social structure of the colonies, as there was real fear amongst the plantation owners that the poor whites might be willing to join in a greater uprising with the slaves. (laughs) 
This leads to codes being written to clearly delineate between the poor white class and the slaves. These laws were designed to drive a wedge in between the two groups and ensure that they remained distinct and separate. In this regard, racism itself becomes a powerful tool in the hands of colonial legislatures to make sure that nobody did anything too dramatic. Really, the most defining aspect of this period of colonial history are the twin pillars of peace and war. Both of these two things are going to do so much to completely define the 18th century prior to 1763. Whereas the growth of the colonies was certainly a key factor in their development, the colonies would also find themselves engaged in a series of wars that would prove transformative events. When we first began the season, we find the colonies engaging in King William's War. Under the command of William Phipps, we see the colonists make their first foray into Acadia, where he scored a convincing victory against Port Royal, followed by a defeat when he moved on Quebec. Really, however, the defining feature of King William's War in North America was the Indian attacks along the main frontier, largely carried out by the Abenaki. One of the chief stressors during the lead-up to the Salem witchcraft trials was the fighting up in Maine. The colonists in Salem were concerned over the increasingly close proximity of the fighting. In the descriptions by many of the accusers, they spoke of seeing the devil in Casco Bay. Casco Bay was one of the hotspots of fighting during that war. War would return to North America when it became a minor theater in the War of Spanish Succession. I'm not going to go into the causes of the war, because if you are curious, we have two episodes on it. However, it put the British colonists at war on two fronts. To the north, the British were facing off against the French and were eyeing a potential invasion of Canada. In the south, the British were facing a second front against the Spanish in Florida. Turning first to the Spanish front, if you will recall, the Spanish continued to control Florida. The colonial plan saw South Carolina leading the way as they marched with some 800 men on St. Augustine. Now, to be fair, when I say that the Spanish controlled Florida, it is important to understand that there is not some huge army hanging out there. For the most part, the Spanish hold on Florida was marginal at best, with St. Augustine essentially being the entire party. Despite this fact, the Spanish had control over a considerable fortification, the Castillo de San Marcos. The British were planning this to be a quick mission. Get in, capture St. Augustine, celebrate, and then head home. The problem, however, is that the Castillo turned into a far harder target than expected. The British had solid shot to batter the walls, but lacked the exploding shells that would have terrorized those inside the Castillo. Instead, the British hung out and just hurled cannonballs at the walls. What emerged was a race between the Spanish and the English to see who would receive relief first. Much to the considerable chagrin of the British, it was the Spanish that won the race. With the British licking their wounds, the Spanish would make their own attempt to invade South Carolina in 1706. This time, however, it was the Spanish that would find themselves in for a bad time. The South Carolina militia was able to score a major victory, delivering significant casualties to the Spanish. To the north, the British would again find themselves moving on Port Royal in Acadia. Though unlike their previous foray into the region, the colonists had far less success. The colonists likewise once again had their eyes set on Quebec. The British concurred that Quebec would be a nice capture and agreed to provide the colonists with help. This, however, largely went nowhere as the British were perpetually delayed, and despite their optimistic overtures, they showed little interest in actually attacking Quebec, though the British would, years after their first attempt, score a victory against Port Royal. Following the end of Queen Anne's War came that long period of peace that allowed the colonies to enjoy both population and economic expansion. This is the time frame where Walpole would enact salutary neglect. This era saw the expansion of the colonial press, an increase in the arts and sciences, and the emergence of a distinctly American culture. This period of peace would last until the 1740s, when some guy named Jenkins got his ear cut off. <laughs> 
the Warhawks back in London used this slight to declare war on the Spanish in an incident that would ultimately merge into the War of Austrian Succession. Again, the colonists found themselves with a war on two fronts, as the Spanish in Florida and the French in Canada were at war with the British. In the south, the British again marched on the Castile de San Marcos in St. Augustine, where, just like years before during Queen Anne's War, they were sent back with little to show for their efforts. Wanting to go for a complete redo of the previous war, the Spanish then moved into the new colony of Georgia with hopes of eventually pushing into South Carolina. However, for the Spanish, that never really works out, and again the Spanish were forced back into Florida. On the Canadian front, the British set their eyes on the town of Lewisburg. Located near the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the town was strategically located and could largely control access to the critical waterway into the Canadian heartland. Though it took some arm twisting, the colonists got their way and it was decided that an army of provincials, mostly from New England, would attempt to take the critical city. On June 17, 1745, the provincial army was able to defeat the French fort defending the city and capture Louisbourg. It was a stunning victory. However, it would fail to become a springboard for anything more dramatic, say for an example a move further to the south on Quebec. Instead, the 1748 Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle ended the war while returning everything to a state of status quo antebellum. For the second time in the last several decades, the colonists were left with a bitter taste in their mouth. Back during Queen Anne's War, they were frustrated with the lack of British assistance in attempting to move on Quebec, despite the colonies laying out significant amounts of money to prepare for the assault. Recall that the planned attack on Quebec never did come to fruition, being called off before it could actually take place. Here, in 1745, the colonists had again scored an impressive victory over Louisbourg, and now the British were ready just to hand it all back. The colonists by this point were feeling mighty unappreciated. The peace reached at Aix-la-Chapelle would prove to be short-lived, and in less than a decade's time another European war would explode, this time the Seven Years' War. The Seven Years' War was a massive global event, and one that would help lay the groundwork for the American Revolution. Now, we of course just wrapped up an 18-episode series on this. However, I will give a quick recap for those who are just now joining us. The conflict would begin in North America, where competing claims between the French and the British would collide in the Ohio country. Further complicating matters is the fact that the Ohio country was controlled by the powerful Iroquois Confederacy, who were not all that pleased with the European incursion into their territory. All of this would come to a head at a location along the Ohio River, known as the Forks of the Ohio, in what is modern-day Pittsburgh. The British wanted to build a fort in the region, and had actually come to an agreement with the local tribes to do just that, which was all fine and good, right up until the moment that the French jumped in and erected Fort Duquesne, much to the very considerable irritation of just about everybody else. Virginia Governor Robert Dinwiddie dispatched a small militia force under the command of a 22-year-old surveyor named George Washington. While moving towards the forks of the Ohio, Washington and a small group broke away upon learning that there were a handful of French troops nearby. The situation unfortunately got away from Washington, and an exchange of gunfire took place. When the smoke cleared, among the dead was a French emissary by the name of Jumonville. And just like that, George Washington had walked himself into an international incident. The French response was to attack Washington's position. Washington and his men would hunker down at the hastily built Fort Necessity, though ultimately Washington had few prospects for victory. Making matters worse for the young George Washington was a misinterpretation of the Articles of Surrender, which saw him taking responsibility for the death of Jumonville. What erupted from this was a war that would consume the colonies for the rest of the 1750s. The war did not get off to an auspicious start for the British either. The French firmly established positions along the Ohio River 
and scored a decisive victory over the British general Edward Braddock along the banks of the Monongahela River. To the north, the British became pinned down, attempting to move into Canada over Lake Champlain. The British were forced to hunker down along the southern banks of Lake George, while the French would set up a position to their north at Fort Curralin, the modern-day Ticonderoga. The French and Indian War, as it was known in North America, would turn into a slog for the British over the next several years. In the Middle and Southern colonies, the British faced near-constant harassment from the French allied tribes. To the north, the British suffered repeated losses, including the loss of their fort at Oswego, followed by a particularly brutal loss at Fort William Henry, that British fort near Lake George. It was not until William Pitt came to power that things would really change. Pitt poured a massive amount of subsidies into the colonies, while at the same time sending over large numbers of regulars. He reorganized how the fighting took place, with the provincial troops doing much of the heavy lifting to prepare for battle, while the British regulars did most of the actual fighting. Suddenly, the colonies, which had been so reluctant to provide the men or resources for the war, found themselves jumping to the occasion in order to cash in. What resulted, at least initially, was a greatly changed situation in the colonies. The British finally began having meaningful successes in the war. In 1758, the British actually started out with a humiliating loss when James Abercrombie and his army of nearly 16,000 were repelled by a much smaller army of 3,500 French at Fort Curralin. However, beyond that single loss, the British made some meaningful progress. British forces managed to capture Louisbourg. To the south, in a feat of diplomacy, the colonists were able to secure a peace with the tribes that had been harassing the Pennsylvania frontier. This would lead to the capture of Fort Duquesne by the British near the end of the year. 1759 would see the British finally capture Quebec after they scored a large victory at the Plains of Abraham. It was an example of a rare open field battle that resulted in the death of both of the commanders. To the south of Quebec, an army under the command of Geoffrey Amherst was able to finally get past the roadblock that had been Fort Curralin. Amherst and company then proceeded north, capturing Crown Point. With the winter of 1759 settling in, the British were primed to launch an invasion of Montreal, the last French stronghold in Canada the following year. Despite an attempt by the French to recapture Quebec in early 1760, the British were able to maintain their position. That summer, the British launched a three-pronged invasion on Montreal, with armies coming from Quebec, Oswego, and Crown Point. All three armies would converge on Montreal in early September 1760, with only meager resistance. As they moved along the rivers, what they generally found was a Canadian population that really did not care who was in charge, so long as they could get back to business and end the fighting. With all three armies arriving at approximately the same time on the doorstep of Montreal, it quickly became clear that the fighting was over. The ensuing surrender did not simply turn over Montreal, but the entirety of Canada to British control. Globally, the Spanish had made the ill-advised decision to join the war with France, and quickly saw huge swaths of their empire evaporate as the British took control. Among the biggest loss was Havana, which in the subsequent peace was traded back to Spain in exchange for Florida. The war had been a stunning victory for the British. It had greatly increased the size of their empire. In North America specifically, the French had been expelled from Canada. However, the war had come at a significant cost for the British. Well, Pitt's spending programs had helped propel the British to impressive military heights, the national debt of the nation had more than doubled. When we began this season, the British colonies were emerging from the tumults that had dominated them from Bacon's Rebellion through the end of the Glorious Revolution. During the next 70 years, the colonial population would soar. During those decades of peace, the economic growth outpaced even the explosive population growth. However, this is not to say that the period was one of unchecked prosperity. 
with the institution of slavery becoming far more entrenched. For their victories, the colonies would likewise face numerous missteps in the various wars that they fought. The outbreak of the French and Indian War is likewise going to help create the foundation for what is going to do a lot to help explain the lead-up to the American Revolution, an event that is now looming just a little over a decade in their future. Next time, we are going to come back and look at the greater overall storylines of this season. Well, we discussed the events this week. Next time, we are going to attempt to pull all those threads together and examine just what it all meant. As a final reminder, if you have a question for our Q&A episode, this, right here, right now, is your last on-the-air reminder to get that into me. When the next episode goes live, the window will officially close. Until that time, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time for part two of our season in review.